I really didn't expect such a polite introduction, having hung out with Ryan last night. <laughs> it was me who was two doors down. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Uh, so I'm really happy to be here. Uh, actually, I spoke here last year in a smaller session. Um, so if you saw that, you can leave now because it's pretty much the same. Um, but it's been a really interesting journey over the last year for me. I hate that word, it's so trite, but it's been really interesting because last year I got up here and talked about this subject for the first time publicly. Uh, it had been an idea that had been brewing in my head um, for a while, for a couple of years. And I said, you know, I'm gonna go and um, write a book. I was making it up. Uh, but on Saturday I got my first book deal, which is really exciting, with Hachette. So that's my big announcement, is that uh, Michael Casey, who is the editor of the Wall Street Journal and I, are writing a book called The Social Organism. It'll be out next November. Um, that was gonna be the punchline of the speech, so I guess we started off early. Uh, yeah, thank you. I'm really excited. And uh, also, I planted, uh, Kara, where are you? Uh, Kara Thornton. I planted her as a, um, a heckler in the audience. She's gonna yell bullshit a couple of times. She's gonna try to do it kind of under her breath, you know, kind of Animal House style, but, but expect that during the presentation. She's gonna keep me on my toes. Uh, so, I wanna get started and talk to you a little bit about um, really what it means to have the social organism and what that is. A lot of people read that as orgasm. My publisher said that it would at least sell 5,000 copies accidentally. <laughs> always, gotta, always gotta have an angle. So, I, I, if I push the button, there we go, this is me. Uh, I'm the CEO of the audience. Uh, I have been a serial entrepreneur uh, since I was like 14. Um, I um, grew up in Mississippi uh, and in Tennessee in a very conservative kind of all boys school environment and I really didn't fit in that well so uh, when I was young I kind of looked for escapes in things and I uh, really got interested in biology which I'm going to talk to you a lot about. I uh, got really interested in biology just kind of growing up in nature and had an amazing teacher uh, who was uh, really special and kind of reached out to me. Her name was Alice Franceschetti, she's, she's still with us. Uh, and it is, and uh, reached out to me early on and kind of changed my life. And a lot of this conversation that we're gonna have stems from that. So, you know, thank the teachers. Uh, and so, right now, I'm the CEO, uh, and for the next five years, I think it was publicly announced that I signed a five-year deal, which everyone thought I was uh, using drugs uh, when I did it, when I sold my company. but. Um, uh, I'm really excited because, you know, what, what we set out to create four years ago with the audience was the notion, and I learned it from being at Disney, Disney had acquired my company before, was the idea that, you know, social media was not a fad, it wasn't uh, something that was just an anecdote, that it was fundamentally and hopefully going to, you know, change things in the world. And that the direct connection between artists and, and content and brands was now really capable without a bunch of gatekeepers in the middle. And so, just to give you one slide about kind of who we are and the way we position it, uh, is that we are, I think, one of the first of its kind. We are now a full-blown media company. The people that acquired us um, are putting a lot of investment and have been investing kind of quietly uh, in the entertainment business for the last four years. Uh, one of the largest investors in Marvel, uh, as it was acquired by Disney. Um, we're now going to be announcing, I think, six global theme parks, um, uh, a movie studio, a record label, uh, and really media label, not even a record label. So we're, we're creating the first uh, direct-to-consumer uh, digital media company um, and really full-blown studio. Uh, we believe that live experiences and digital content are really the future of all of this. Uh, and so you know, that's, that's enough about the company. What I want to talk to you about is about communication architectures and how they've changed over time uh, and then how I think we can look towards nature as a great metaphor for what's happening. So if we go back in time and we look at the idea of communication architectures, you know, the church is really the first big broadcast network. 
there were really no middle class. There were just very wealthy people, kind of aristocracy, clergy, and then a bunch of peasants. And so the architecture, the communication architecture was build a big building in a town, put a steeple, ring the bell at 7 a.m., everyone comes and converges, and we share the word of God. And that's a, a fascinating architecture of communication that humans created to get a mass message out. And it works extremely well, as we've seen uh, throughout history. But what's fascinating is, is that that architecture actually influences the type of content that is being put through that channel. And so what we see happening is, is that we see that the messages that come from that tend to be very iconographic, right, with all of the imagery, and think about all of the art throughout the years, uh, whether it's through the, you know, through the Renaissance or through the Enlightenment, that's, that's all religious-based art and, and, and culture that was, that was derived from that. Think about the dogma that comes, think about the, if you do this, then this will happen. You know, if you don't do this, then you know what's gonna happen. And so there's a tremendous amount of content that is created that fits that kind of broadcast architecture. And, and the only reason I'm talking about it is, is that I think that there's been a real interesting change that, 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 is, that we're seeing in front of us. And so if you look at and just look at the strict parallelism of creating a broadcast architecture and then saying, well, that communication structure, right, but gets the content, then there's really no difference in what we've done in television and radio is we went into a town, we put up a tall building, we broadcast a signal at 7 p.m., tune in, and here's what it's going to be. And what's fascinating is, is that we, we invented products like the 30-second ad and the three-second ad and the five-second ad, these interrupted types of, of, of content that are meant to tell us what to do. They're meant to give us desire. If you do this, then this will happen. If you, know, you have the American Express card, then you too, right, will have access and privilege. If you use the American Express card, uh, you know, then you too will have 3% body fat walking hand in hand with someone beautiful down the beach. And then it also says, you know, if you don't do this, then you will live in fear of bad breath, and you will live in fear, you know, of a pimple. And so there are all these architecture and communication architectures that I think we laugh at but we're all part of this machine, right? We're all part of this system. And I'm not necessarily making any judgment about it, except I think it's remarkably unhealthy for a society. Uh, but I think it's really interesting because it's a lot of the same concepts and the nature of the content. And one of the fascinating things about a broadcast architecture system is, unless you're one of those fanatics that writes like a thousand letters to the TV station, there's no feedback. Nobody's sitting there, unless you're like a graffiti artist tagging a billboard, nobody's communicating back about the messages that are being given to them necessarily inside of these systems. It's really a one-way system. And all of us at some point, I assume in this room, have been part of that machine. And so if you look at what's happened now with the advent of internet-based networks, you know, I don't need to give you the history of it, but it's a decentralized system, right? The idea of you know, stemming from the fear of you know, nuclear annihilation was that we would distribute the architecture of communication, that there wouldn't be one tower that would be broadcasting the signal, that we would enable anyone in this room to become a tower, that we would enable anyone on the network to have equal access, to have equal contribution ability to a system. That is the disruption that we're all talking about in our society right now. It removes gatekeepers, it removes these really institutionalized systems that relied upon controlling distribution architectures, right? Whether they were product distribution architectures, you know, remember when people used to line up at a Tower Records on a Tuesday to wait for the album to drop? They don't even exist anymore, right? But Universal Music still acts like they are their tower records, trust me. They, they can't even break that mindset. And I'll go into that a little bit with one of the stories I'll tell you. But social media is really an evolution of our culture, uh, whether we like it or not. 
You know, the, the TCP IP networks that it's built upon, the internet that it's built upon is here to stay, right? And the idea that we are now connected with each other in a, in a network that has no time and distance. There is no Tuesday morning drop of an album anymore, right? We're seeing the erosion of what it means to have prime time, right? Now we binge consume, you know, uh, of Netflix or, or a television episode. We can't wait for it to be recorded so we can skip the ads. And we watch it in our time, in our, in our convenience. And so these are massive concepts that are happening because social media and because of the internet network has broken these things apart. And whenever big changes happen, there are always vacuums, right? And companies like were mentioned earlier, uh, Airbnb or Uber or all these things are breaking apart institutions like taxi cabs and hotel monopolies and things like that. And so the same thing is happening inside of our media structure. Right? Social media is, is, as I said earlier, it's here to stay. And we all have to understand how we, can, how, how we will be part of that ecosystem. So, when I was 15 years old, uh, as a bit of an outcast in a very conservative society, um, I mentioned Alice Franceschetti. I was really good in biology. And I loved looking at my microscope, like I was that nerd. I had a microscope for Christmas and I loved getting pond water and looking at it and seeing, and I got really fascinated by just the visual beauty of the structure of nature. And I, I really had this passion and expressed it quite a bit. And so when I was 15, um, I was kind of struggling with, with acceptance at school and so she reached out to me and she said, look, you know, I want you to do something with your passion. Um, why don't you go work in a research lab? And I was like, wow, uh, I guess I'm gonna like, be like Doogie Howser. I think he was popular at the time. Um, and, uh, and so I went and did it, and I worked uh, in a platelet research lab um, at the University of Tennessee at the research hospital there uh, called the Bold Hospital. And uh, I became fascinated with just the process of biology with metabolic pathways, uh, with how antibodies and antigens react and how it's really just pattern recognition. And you know, we have viruses that really, like people, people use the word virus thinking it's just like a bacteria or a pathogen. The amazing thing about a virus is, is that when it attaches itself to the receptor, it takes its information and puts it into your information and rewrites you, right? It's literally rewriting your code. It's literally changing who you are. And it's one of the biggest kind of moments of evolution is how viruses have contributed to our evolution. And so uh, all of these concepts were really part of my life when I was 14, 15, 16, uh, and then uh, I went off to summer school and um, started experimenting with marijuana, uh, which was, you know, changes the way you look at things. Uh, you know, smoking weed, talking about French literature was like my college experience. Um, and I gave up on science completely. And then four years ago, a magazine uh, gave me this like cringe-worthy award of like a digital maverick. At least it wasn't guru, which is like my like least favorite expression ever. Um, and so they asked me, they said, you know, Oliver, as part of the magazine, we need content. Uh, what we want to do is we want you to draw what you think the future of social media is, or of social culture. And so I was like, I really can't draw. Like, I like art, I can look at drawings, I can tell you what I like, but I'm not really sure I can draw. And the only things I knew how to draw, uh, and with any proficiency, were network diagrams, right, from the telco industry, because my first job was, I built the first voice over the internet network in America in 96 for Quest Communications in Denver. And, and I knew how to draw like, here's what a fiber optic network looks like, here's what a router looks like, here's what a switch looks like, here's, here's this. And those are, those are kind of those, you know, internet type drawings you've seen a hundred times that, you know, you use like Omnigraphle to draw. And then, uh, 
And then I was like, well, and also I know how to draw like metabolic pathways. I know how to draw the arachidonic acid pathway when you cut yourself and a series of cascading events happen and it results in your platelet transforming itself into like this little prickly thing and you know, it, it, it activates this like spider web substance, you know, from fibrin, with fibrinogen and then it, you know, seven minutes later it kind of curls back in and seals the wound. And I was like, I can do that. And then I went out into the desert, which I normally do once a year. I really want to do it this year. Uh, and just kind of disconnected. And thinking about this kind of task at hand. And then suddenly it like all clicked in my head. Uh, it was kind of a trippy experience. Uh, and, I, and it clicked in my head and I was like, holy shit. I was like, if you look at the nature, the architecture of nature, and you look at, by the way, this is my embarrassing photo of me. I forgot to mention that I won the International Science Award for Discovered Region on the Human Platelet when I was 16. Uh, but I just throw that in there for pure embarrassment. I mean, look at that. Like, what a great photo. <laughs> yeah, that was at Epcot, by the way. Go Epcot. Uh, the irony is, is that I like, then went and became the head of innovation at Disney uh, years later. Um, gotta love those science programs though, please support them. Um, and so I'm sitting there and I'm like, what in the world you know, am I gonna draw? And then it suddenly clicked and I'm like, oh my God, like I remember looking in the microscope at this image. And this is what's called a volvox. This is also what's called a holonic structure. Holonic structures are, I think, kind of like Kara, this is the time you used to feel bullshit. Uh, holonic structures are ones that are both individual, but part of a whole, but each one can describe the whole system. And it's sort of like a synecdoche, it's like, you know, one describes the other and you can be part of a whole. And your DNA is an example. Every cell in your body has the code that makes both your hardware and software. Uh, and, but at the same time, you look at the, at the whole human being, right? And so one cell doesn't necessarily make a human, but you know, a trillion of them put together do, right? And so if you think about what this is, this looks like one, I mean, I'm sure someone has seen this in their, in their science class before. It looks like one organism, but in reality, it's 50,000 organisms that have all come together and that can communicate with each other without time and distance, because they're all interconnected, right? But they all start differentiating themselves. One says, oh, I'm gonna be the energy producer, and it becomes photosynthetic. One says, oh, I need to swim us towards the light, so it grows a flagellum, a little squiggly tail, and it does phototropism, where it goes towards the light. And it's a really, it's a, it's a, it's a primitive example of a community that works together, but that is made up of individual cells, right? But it has this like, beautiful architecture of these daughter, daughter duplicate colonies that, that grow inside of it. And then I remember this image from biology. This is mycelium. This is really nature's internet network. The discoveries that are going on right now are really fascinating around this. This is just mold, right? For, for all intents and purposes, a fungus. Uh, and, uh, but the largest organism in the world is actually in the lower right corner of Oregon. It's one of these that covers hundreds of square miles or tens of square miles. It's the largest biomass in the world. And it really is nature's internet. They're now discovering that trees communicate through this in the soil. There was an amazing article in Nature last November as I was kind of writing this whole thing this kind of postulating that came out that studied how a tree in danger will send out a signal and it will get nutrients shipped to it through this network. It's really fascinating stuff. And so I'm kind of in the desert, tri tripping out and thinking about this, and then I remembered seeing this image. Does anybody know what this image is? This is Facebook. This is looking at the concentrations of attention that are put inside of a platform like Facebook. A platform with 1.4 billion people, 1.4 billion organisms connected. And it dawned on me that if 
there are 1.4 billion of these cells, of these organisms that each have their own holonic independence, and they're all connected via a network that has no time and distance, then we really are building what looks like a living organism. And if that's true, then we know a lot of the rules already that make life. We've studied that since the dawn of man. And so what really clicked throughout this whole experience was, is that indeed we are looking at building this giant living organism. And I'm not talking about like Kurzweil's, we'll all upload our brains into a computer and we'll all be a cyborg, right? I'm not talking about that at all. I'm really talking about a metaphor of how we organize ourselves as a society with this new technology, how we organize our governments, how we organize our communications, how we speak to people, how we you know, suddenly don't like the Confederate flag and now it's banned. Really, it took 100 years for that to happen and then suddenly this summer, you know, we have a cultural moment and now they take it out of retail? That's fascinating to me. That means that something's happening that allows us to trigger these moments in our culture and then we suddenly change. We lose our tail. We evolve, right? And so, as this metaphor grew in my mind, I was like, well look, you know, I think everybody that's been through biology kind of knows the seven rules of life, right? You need to feed it, it lives at, you know, within itself, it uh, you know, follows the rules of flow dynamics, it becomes more complex over time, it has a metabolism, you know, all those different rules. And so I started looking at them, and I was like, wow, I was like, we've been part of, since Diet Coke and Mentos, which was built on a platform that I created called Rever, which was really one of the first big viral videos that had any purpose uh, to sell more Diet Coke and Mentos. Um, it did, it rose, Diet Coke sells 5% in North America. Yeah. Although Diet Coke wrote in Business Week, our product is meant to be consumed, not exploded. Um, but then they changed their tune when they saw that they had the highest sales of all time, that, that 4th of July when people... Um, and so, so, you know, as having been part of a lot of these things, I've seen these patterns, right? Anyone knows that you can look inside of Facebook analytics, inside of insights, and you can see viral propagation patterns of how ideas are being shared. And so at the same time that I'm tripping out in the desert thinking of this shit, you're looking at a billion pieces of data coming in every second off of platforms like Facebook that we never had before, right? You know, the only feedback you get from a billboard is if somebody, as I said, defaces it or honks at it. Right? And suddenly we're seeing like, wow, if you put this piece of content into the system and it has this, then it reacts this way. And so and there's this amazing convergence happening of how much we understand about social systems and about our behavior, and at the same time, a macro level of organization. So, if we have these seven rules, then what are they and how do they apply to us? Right? So, the first one is, is that you have to feed it. And this makes total sense. That phone that you have in your hand is like a big old mouth. It's just sitting there consuming images. It's, you're uploading images, you're uploading feelings, you're uploading text, you're uploading video. You know, it is this constant feeding mechanism, right? And it's about your personal identity, it's about your experiences, it's about what you love, what you hate, you know? But in reality, we're feeding this system. Putting a banner ad on something is a parasite. No one has consciously clicked on a banner ad in the last five years, right? Not one of you. But <laughs> those are the people that sell them. Uh, <laughs> they're like, not me! Uh, <laughs> you know, it's like, come on. Like, all that money that's going into, you know, this programmatic, you know, sorry guys, I know this is a marketing conference and I know a lot of you do this. But it's like, that's contributing nothing to a system. Half the traffic's fake anyway. It's like, they're just parasites. And so you're looking at this, you're like, if we're building this system and it needs to be nourished, then let's focus on content. And not abstracted bullshit content, but like art. Let's focus on, you know, this is ironic by the way, I did the selfie song talking about art, who represents a bunch of Instagrammers. But I think that's art. But you know, it's like, it's how do we participate 
in this system in that we're adding value to the system, that we are nourishing it. If you look at any narcissistic person, which half of you have to be in this room, and you look at how much energy goes into grooming that photo, like I see kids today that have five photo apps before they upload into Instagram, right? It's like a touch up here, it's like does the light look right, you know, do I look tan? Um, if you look at how much care and attention is going to that, then let's put the same care and attention in finding the best artist and being a patron to these people, you know, and supporting this, these, these, you know, creatures that live amongst us that are contributing things that change our ideas, that evolve our culture. If we're a big organism that's this social organism, then those are the mutations, right? Not to use an X-Men reference. But those are the things that are special and interesting, that keep us on our toes, that keep us moving forward as a culture, right? Those are the novel ideas. And I think we all, sitting on all of the money, the $580 billion or whatever that globally goes into advertising and marketing a year, you know, what if we just took one percentage of that and dedicated it towards art and culture and music and nourishing the system? I think that's a new value that we all could share, right? And I think there are a lot of interesting ways for you to be part of that. The second thing is, is that living systems have metabolisms. It means that we're taking something like light or sugar or you know, any of these kind of you know, nutrients that we have and we're converting them into energy, we're converting them into motion, we're converting them into metabolic systems. In the social organism, our emotions are those metabolic factors, right? We've all been sitting there being told by people like, put an emotion in it, make it exciting. Think about the mechanics of a social network. If you looked at that image with those concentrations of a billion people, that Facebook image I showed you, right? If you look at that and you say, what are those concentrations? Those bright spots on that network are the influencers. They are the people that have bigger reach than any of us in this room. They're the ones with five million fans. Well, how did they get there? If you look at each one of them and look at the type of content that they're putting into the system, it is, it is resonating emotionally with someone. Whether it is looking at loneliness, like look at someone like PewDiePie, who sits there foul-mouthed and sits on YouTube and plays video games, but he's like your best friend. To a 14-year-old kid, he's your best friend. He hangs out with me. That's an emotional connection, right? And so I want to be part of that. I want to keep subscribing to him. I want to be part of that experience because I don't want to be lonely, right? Or if you think about the emotions of pride or anger or fear or any of these emotions, that's what's driving sharing, right? We rely, because we don't have that ring the bell at 7 a.m. and everyone congregates anymore moment, we don't have that in our culture really anymore, unless it's the Super Bowl or some other live event where they're you know, mainly sporting, but we just don't have that. And so those moments are actually cared about, are, are, are created by those moments of sharing, when everyone in this room shares something because of an emotion attached to it. And so if you look at any successful piece of content in these systems, they always fit within this kind of Polutnik checks, I can't even pronounce it right, uh, around this kind of emotional complex, right? It always fits one of these pedals of, of a core emotion, of surprise, delight, you know, all of those things. And so the idea here is, is that when you add nutrients to the system, make sure that they're connected with some emotional response, right? That they, that they are moving the metabolism forward and that they're creating a moment of sharing. And then you've got the idea, right, that there's a physical world outside of this system, right? Living systems have barriers, they have walls. Some of them have permeable membranes so that things can come and go through their skin. Some of them have, you know, ingest and outgest, uh, uh, I don't know the word, but you know, portals, whatever you wanna call it, orifices. Uh, but, but really the idea here is, is that and if you thought about it, it's like if there were a big bright light in the sky and it flashed and there was an explosion, then Twitter would erupt, right? It would just be like a frenzy of metabolic activity of people feeding the system with the image of that in the sky and, you know, and then spreading throughout the world. It's a really beautiful visual if you think about it. But it literally is the fact that there is an outside and an inside. This is the core idea of a lot of things we do 
uh, you know, when you sponsor a big event like we were talking about earlier, like a NASCAR event, and then you're, or you sponsor a concert, you know, well, what did I get out of it? I got a, I got the stage name, I got a billboard, I had some, you know, pretty people out front passing out product. What we do is we bring 15 of these bright spots on the network and watch them experience it vicariously. And you take 15 kids to a pool party or to a concert or to a sponsored event and they'll generate 100, 200 million impressions in, an, in a day. It's fascinating. And so what you're doing is you're taking these live experiences and building these digital extensions almost like a living reality show. That's one of the concepts that, that is really interesting right now is it's the whole FOMO emotion, right? It's I'm not there, but I can live vicariously through this person's perspective. The next idea is that life has an immune system. Life shifts, right? It, it gets rid of pollution. And this is what's happening. Why in the world have tens of millions of people put ad block? We are aggressively trying to do it. The body does the same thing. When an antigen comes into the system, we have an immune response. When a shooting happens in a school over racism, we get rid of the Confederate flag. Our body rejects it. And the same thing is happening in our culture. We're seeing it over and over and over at a faster and faster pace. Like, there are good things about it, and that we evolve culturally and become more open and more accepting of people. And then there are the pitchfork lynch mobs online of trolls and all of those things, right? But ultimately, I believe that we all have this responsibility of acting like a member of an immune system, of protecting ourselves. And so these platforms become amazing ways to rid ourselves. The other fascinating thing about it is, a platform like Facebook is actually now designed with this in mind. We all know about reach and engagement inside of a platform like Facebook that's based upon how many likes, how many comments, how many shares. Those become indicators of value, right? I put that piece of content, it gets a bunch of likes, it gets a bunch of shares, and lo and behold, it reaches a lot more people. That's an algorithm that has this positive reinforcement, this positive response, right? We've all spent time thinking about how we optimize our content, how we maximize our, our reach and engagement. And the reason is, is that you're contributing something of nourishing value, you're connecting it with emotions, you're connecting it with the real world, right? And you're adding value. And the second that you don't, it spits you out. You just don't go anywhere. Inside of a platform like Facebook as well, when I was dealing with you know, running hundreds of these celebrity accounts, and we literally were reaching like a billion people a day uh, through, through only 300 of those bright spots on the network of influencers, we would see that if a person was being spammy, if they were talking about them, you know, their product or trying to advertise inside of that platform, they, they literally would have start killing their network. They would start destroying the reach and engagement of their network. And it's actually a punitive system. We've all seen it if we you know, try to do spammy behavior inside of these systems, it kind of cuts you off. And so it's one of those rules of nature that you know, when you're adding value and you're not you know, being a parasite, you're welcome into the system and otherwise you're kicked off. The next rule, and this is fascinating from my perspective because it has to do with things like copyright law and others. If you look at the, at the, at the architecture of nature, right, it's based on flow dynamics. This is literally water and nutrients coming from the soil, going up into the sky because the water is evaporating through the leaves and it is creating a suck, it's creating a suction system of the xylem of the tree. If I cut off a branch, the branch dies, right? When we did the selfie song, that song had been out for four months and it had about 100,000 listens on SoundCloud. And then I found it in a, in, uh, with the kids uh, that created it. And I was like, wow, this is like a perfect cultural moment. Like, but first, let me take a selfie. Like, this is happening right now. How do we, how do we, how do we architect this in such a way? And so we, got, we went and got 46 of our bright spots on the network, and we put them in the video. It's a very simple concept. But that meant that now 46 people had some emotional connection to that video so that they would share it through their branches. And they did. And the song has sold 12 million singles. It doesn't happen in the music business anymore, right? It only happens because 14-year-old kids love it. 
and 14 year old kids get an iTunes gift card from every aunt and uncle because that's all I got. Like, I don't know, they're on the internet all the time. Feed the system. And so, and so they buy stuff. Like, we sold millions of songs to 14 and 15. Go ask Jack and Jack, you know, who every time they put up a six second clip on Vine, they sell a quarter million singles without fail on iTunes. Nicki Minaj doesn't do that. Katy Perry doesn't do that, right? It's fascinating how, what a connection is. So going with this story, so a couple of months in, Universal Music, Sony Music, all these people are calling us, they're like, oh, you have the biggest song in the world, it's number one in 43 countries, it's got 300 million views on YouTube, there's no record label attached, we need to be attached to this because we hate these stories about how you can do it on your own. Literally. <laughs> they're like, Macklemore has heard us. And so, uh, and so we're, you know, these artists that I work with are like, the chain smokers are like, we want to be real artists. And to be a real artist, we're going to get validated by the music industry. And that's cutting a record deal. And so I said, well, okay, well, your, your product, you made the thing. If you want to do it, do it. But let's make sure we go in there and know what we're getting into because I've fought the record business for so long. And Sean Parker, you know, this, like started this company with me, built Napster, and okay, we end up selling it for like an unprecedented amount of money. Within one week of it being sold to Universal, now mind you, we had followed the idea of the Harlem Shake. It was like the idea of, but first let me, right? But first let me drink a protein, but first let me take a dick pic. Like there were hundreds of them. <laughs> there were actually 343,000 derivative works of that song. That was fueling the system. That was the nutrients that was making that thing a global fucking sensation. And, it's, and I'm sitting there, and the second that Universal buys it, they cut it off in all but 14 territories, because that's all Bebo's got. Because of licensing, because they cut off the branches. They shut down all of the derivative works. You get that annoying, but this copyright, blah, you know, shitting on your thing. And I'm just like, oh my god. It went from number one in 43 countries to below 20 in all of them overnight. I was like, wow, you just proved this rule. That if you cut off these branches, if you don't allow frictionless sharing of ideas, then you are no better than a book burner. You're no better than someone that's trying to cut off the flow of information and you die. And luckily, Universal and those companies are facing death. The next thing is, is that, because they're just parasites. They're just the worst. I can't say anything nice about them. <laughs> and I like saying nice things. I like people, you know, but not them. Um, I think I was quoted in Entrepreneur Magazine because they were interviewing me, and it was right after the Super Bowl. And I'm like, Katy Perry, she gets up and she performs in front of, you know, hundreds of millions of people. And not one Facebook post about her being at the Super Bowl during the Super Bowl or after the Super Bowl, and Universal Music and so they released this big press release like, yeah, it's the first digital. I'm like, are you kidding me? Did you not think that maybe when she has 78 million fans on Facebook, you could probably do something with that? No, because it's not about selling CDs at Tower Records, uh, which is still their value. So, enough about the music business. Um, another fascinating thing is that we reproduce, right? The living systems reproduce. Our ideas reproduce through means. Mimetic expression is like genetics. It's that idea that we're taking an idea, it's like a little virus, and we're putting it in our culture, right? And we're changing our ideas. We become different when we consume something, right? You know, we all know the expression, you can't unwatch it, right? <laughs> we all know the examples of that. But it's also with the ideas that we have, right? This is one of the great names of keep calm and blank. Right? And not to make it trite and not to make it about injure and other things, but like, this is a reality. But first, let me blank became a meme. That's what made it successful. It's the ability that we embraced viral reproduction of an idea, right? It's not too dissimilar from Doug Beauty Sketches when the male version of it, right? We, when we did Beauty Sketches, we wanted people to do that. Right? It was a big interesting conversation with Unilever because they're like, you know, I work with a brand right now that we're doing a campaign that's based on the meme. And I was like, you know that people are gonna be like, but, but I, you know, it's like I dance in this, I do this. 
And then the last idea is that this is not getting simpler. Human beings did not get simpler throughout evolution, right? We got more complex. And these ideas are becoming much more complex. These systems are becoming much more complex. And through complexity, sometimes, there are big opportunities for people to abuse the system, right? We've seen it, we've heard about it through all these systems. One of the biggest things that scares me through the complexity of all of this is that what if Mark Zuckerberg woke up tomorrow and just said, you know what? I'm just gonna dial down that word in Facebook, whatever it is. Three days ago, uh, you could not write, everyone will know, inside of Facebook and publish it. The system rejected it, it said it was spam. So if you went to type that in, right? And so what's fascinating is, is that as these things become more complex, we must have a better understanding of them. It is important to study them. It's important to know what we're getting into, right? Because there's, you know, we are building this organism and we don't want failure points. We built it to be unfailable, and so, you know, it's really important. Uh, and so as they become more complex, we also have the technology to understand it more and to actually be open and transparent. Openness and transparency. I worked, with, I worked with a guy in Iceland called Jong Nar, who was a comedian who ran for governor after the, or ran for mayor after the economic collapse and won in drag, it was really funny. Um, and, uh, and he had this treatise that he wrote about humanism and humanity. And it was the, the best line ever uh, in, in part of it that said, uh, it was called The Best Party, by the way, it was named after Tina Turner, Simply the Best, the song. It was a political movement, it's not a global political movement. And he said, we will, we will rid ourselves of corruption by participating in it openly. And I was like, wow, that's one of the most poetic, fascinating ideas I've ever heard because that's just business, right? It's like, it's, you know, we're participating in it openly. And so as these things become more complex, we must, as a society, force ourselves to have openness, force ourselves to have transparency, force ourselves to have net neutrality. We can't have the gatekeepers of old. Right? 1.4 billion people with their identity inside of a system like Facebook connected to each other comes with massive community responsibility. Right? We all have to protect that. And so, really, in my mind, social really is changing everything. Right? And it changed the way we market a movie. This was Spring Breakers, first movie ever to be in 1,100 theaters, uh, in 1,100 screens with zero traditional media made $36.6 million at the box office, and we spent 1 14th of what it required by the exhibitors to even be in the, in the movie. It changes the way we launch concerts. We sell hundreds of thousands of tickets a month now through the artist, not through the local promoter, through the artist, right? That direct connection. It changes the way we launch new artists, right? It changes the way we, ch we have conversations as a brand. I always, you know, make jokes about American Express, but they've actually been one of our best partners because they saw that they couldn't be this exclusive brand anymore, that they needed to embrace a different part of our society. And so they made a 43-minute documentary with us called Spent Waiting for Change by the guys who did Inconvenient Truth and um, Waiting for Superman. I couldn't be more proud of the fact that a brand like American Express made a movie about payday lenders and about their predatory behavior in our society, and about 60 to 70 million people that literally are paying 10 to 20% of their income just to cash a check and be able to pay their bills because they have distrust of the system or they've been taken advantage of. And so if you haven't seen this, about, I think it's got about 12 million views on YouTube. It's one of my proudest things, right, is that, is that we got to influence. There are now three states that have enacted legislation because a brand came in and sponsored a piece of content that changed the conversation, right? And then it fundamentally changes the relationship that these brands have with their consumers, that they can become patrons. And so I'll leave you with these ideas about how to participate in the system from a human experience perspective. You know, become a patron of the arts. That does not mean hiring an artist and dictating to them what they should make for your brand. It means working in collaboration and partnership with them so that they can express themselves. You know, sponsor these big live events like the rise of the music festival has really been a positive effect on our culture. It's really been fascinating. And then allow you to become part of storytellers. Allow yourself to, to not be afraid of controlling your image, because you can't anymore. It's about guiding your image, about finding the right people to connect to. So, 
With that, I ha I'm very optimistic about the future. I really believe that we have a chance to elevate ourselves and, and do good in all of this. I really do. And it just means that we understand it, that we apply some simple rules, that we either use this metaphor or other metaphors. But I'm very hopeful about the future. I'm so excited, as you mentioned, that my company just got acquired. I got acquired by a company in Dubai that wants to build a human-centric media company. Like, we don't think of that as from that part of the world. We, we've, we've been biased, right, by media or by experiences. And so, so it's really interesting to start, for me personally, to start seeing how, you know, people that don't look like us and don't act like us and don't even believe what we believe are, are really striving for humanistic experiences as well. And so, you know, that's really been opening my mind uh, a lot lately. So, with that being said, thank you. I'm gonna do Q&A. Here, I thought you were gonna yell bullshit at one point. Uh, and, uh, and also, um, there's more information about this book that's coming out uh, next year, which I'm really excited about. Um, so thank you very much. And then, I know that you're gonna heckle me next. I appreciate it. Thank you.